All right. Welcome back. Uh, please do go ahead and take a seat. We are going to get started with our afternoon program. Uh, let me ask you guys, how was lunch? Good. If you're answering, that at least means you're awake, so that's a good start. Um, I thought it was delicious. Uh, we've got a really exciting lineup for the afternoon. And so as everybody funnels in, uh, I'm going to focus us back on a few of the topics from this morning. So we're going to still talk about entrepreneurial journeys and stories. Uh, we're going to come back in a few minutes to a panel on women entrepreneurship and the role of women uh, in this whole ecosystem, uh, which should be a very interesting discussion. Uh, but first, we have a speaker returning to this topic and idea of the tech storm, uh, also coming from Stockholm. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys to join me in welcoming to the stage uh, an author of the book Gear Up, a co-creator of the company Skype, uh, and an inspiring entrepreneur. Uh, and I'm going to say his name two different ways. Uh, this is Mr. Jonas Kjellberg, and I said, can I say Kjellberg, or how do you say it in Swedish? He said, in Swedish you say, Chalvai. So, Jonas Chalvai. Okay, thank you very much. So, I'm Jonas Kjellberg, as you very said, and in Swedish it's Chalvai. Um, I'm going to take you through the next uh, 20 minutes here. Um, so, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm an investor, uh, I'm an author, uh, I've done a lot of things. Um, as you heard, I had the big fortune of being joining the founding office of Skype, which everybody said that's going to be a very stupid idea. Turned out to be okay. Um, I also had the opportunity to start working for a big fund called the Kinevik Group, where I invested over a billion euros into a company called the Rocket Internet which everybody said, who would ever want to invest in a company that clones thing and also a seed factory? Stupid idea. Today they are listed. I also invested 400 million euros into a company called Salando. Do you know it here in Turkey? I don't think you do, huh? Uh, it's a German company. Um, they basically sell shoes on the internet. And you know the time and energy I had to spend convincing the, the investors because everyone thought this is a stupid idea. Who will ever want to buy shoes on the internet? It worked out okay, they're listed today. I was also the chairman of the board of a company called iCloud. I started, that we sold to Apple. I started a couple of companies, uh, Nunuba and another company called Kennetworks, uh, both picked up by Yahoo. So if there are any entrepreneurs out there that want to get rid of their company not working, you can always call Yahoo. They pick up a lot of shit. So basically, m all my life has been, how do you fuck up big companies? <laughs> how do you change the game? How do you disrupt things? And we heard you know, about the tech storm. And for me, it's all about surviving things. How do we do these things? But <clears throat> if this would be a normal lecture, I'd be standing here talking about all my successes. But I'm going to do totally different. Today, I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes talking about all my failures. It normally doesn't take 20 minutes. It takes more than one and a half hour if we really want to get to the bottom with all this shit I've created. Um, and if this would be a normal lecture, I'd be standing here and talking to you. But let's flip coin this around. Let's interact. Please uh, interrupt me. Tell me I'm wrong and see if we can get the dialogue going. I often have very strong opinions about things I don't have any really clue about. So let's start maybe with the first question here. Is it the big that beat the small, or is it the fast that beat the slow? Anyone? Fast? Hands up for the people that think it's the fast that beat the slow. Okay, and hands up for the people that think it's the big that beat the small. One, two, 
And then let's look around, you know, in the world today. The big companies are the ones doing really good. And this was what really puzzled me, you know. You have the tech things ch challenging, but when do you actually survive? When is it more important to be fast, and when is it important to be big? And during my, due to my success of Skype, I had the opportunity to go to Stanford to start to try to figure this out. And I started lecturing uh, at Stanford, which was great fun. But after a while, the professor Tom Kosny came to me and said, Jonas, it's great that you lecture here at Stanford. Uh, the students love you, you're very provocative, you say what you think. There's only one little challenge we have with you, Jonas. Okay, what's that? Uh, I can see you haven't actually read the literature. So it would be great if you could read the literature before you come here and actually teach it. Okay, fair point. So give me the literature list and I read it all. How many here has read American management literature? Hands up. A few, not a lot. Okay, well, you haven't missed anything. But what I came to the conclusion is if you read the summary, you get the theory, you read the first chapter, you really get it. So I said to Tom, why don't we write a book together about all your theories and your epiphany of Stanford and how you launch great companies? And he thought, ah, that's a great idea. And he maybe was thinking about this big Bible he was gonna write about how you drive successful companies. And I said, no, let's write a book that is 100 pages long with half pictures and basically puts all the theories in place. He was not very convinced, but I said, let's do it anyway. Then we sent the first beta to his colleagues at Harvard. What do you think they said when they saw this book? Rubbish. Yeah, great. You, Tom, you've written uh, children's books. Okay, so, and Tom wasn't very happy, so I went back, but Tom, you know, they don't understand my brilliance. It's, um, a lot of people don't actually do that. But let's, uh, let's go and talk to all the publishers. So I went to the publisher and presented this book. What do you think they said? Well, what they said, they didn't even say things. You know, they sent me these beautiful letters saying, thank you, Mr. Kjellberg, we'll, wish you great success somewhere else. <laughs> that basically means fuck off, don't come back. <laughs> Your book is bullshit. Pissed me off and said, you know, I started a lot of companies, how hard can it really be to actually publish a book? You know, you print it on paper and you start selling it. So that's exactly what we did. And since I was pissed, I wrote another book. And this book has only pictures. I often, when I work as well for BCG, I often give these to CEO. They get the CEOs, they get very confused. <laughs> now there's a third book launched, and it's published by a company called Wiley, most prestigious publishing house in the world. Why do you think they would publish my third book? Anyone? The first two did well. Yes, they're actually selling quite well. And when things sell, you can be very obnoxious with the standards of the things you want to do. And this is actually also how the framework is built, because I'm going to talk about today's framework, and, but in the centerpiece here is customer acquisition. A very forgotten perspective. So initially also I wanted to call the book sales, but then Tom and Lena were basically, no, please, Jonas. So now it's a customer acquisition centric strategy framework because we had to get the word strategy in there because it was very important for them because otherwise we would never be published in the Harvard Business Review. But customer acquisition. So that's the basically the first topic. Let's see if we can get this one. Okay. My reflection in all the companies I ever started, you know, 75, 95% of all startups fail. 75% of all startups fail during this customer acquisition perspective. Because what I learned as the first C when I became the CEO of my first company, the only thing people wanted from me was growth. More customers, more employees. It's all about how do you, for me, unlock frequency. I was quite happy because initially, I didn't learn this at school. 
They teach you so much, but they never teach you about what's really, really important for most boards, and that is unlocking growth. I was quite happy because I initially, very early on, got a very small brochure. It said basically, I came to the conclusion, sales is math. You do 100, knock on doors, you talk to 10, you have one customers. You do 200, you sell more. It's not complicated. It's basically, how do you increase frequency? How do you take it to the next level? How do you innovate in it? And let me be very honest about this. If you find and innovate in a new way of unlocking customers, do you think these customers come up on stage and tell you why? That's a, a key secret you keep very, very close to your heart. Take Spotify. Why did they succeed? Brilliant product, of course, but they unlocked the growth by teaming up with telcos. Most of their premium customers come into telcos. They did a partnership with Facebook. What did we do at Skype? We started sending mails to everyone. Do you remember Facebook? In the beginning, they sent mails to everyone. It's all about how do you innovate in frequency of driving new customers. And when I was the CEO of this first company, we had no clue. This was a telco company. We started actually, we started trying to call people around the world because we understood that that's how things were done to unlock growth in telcos. But we very fast came to the conclusion it takes quite a lot of time to actually dial all these numbers. So we came to the conclusion, what happens if we get a computer that calls 10 phones in the row and then we connect one to the operator? Making it more efficient. The other challenge we had is that we had to buy a lot of these phone numbers from telcos and listings. They cost nearly one euro a piece. But then we came to the conclusion, what happens if we call all the number combinations available? Because the beauty is here that the computer never complained about calling the wrong number. <laughs> Until one day, the red phone at the Navy base is called, and it's the red phone only used for the prime minister, and there is this guy, hi, would you like to buy cheap telephony? I had to spend nearly a full day with Swedish secret police <laughs> trying to convince them that we were so stupid that we called all the number combinations available. So if they had more red phones, we would be calling them as well. But I think this is the perspective. How do you unlock growth? And for me, when I understood that running a company is about increasing frequency, that is the only thing I did. Started a new telco, sold that to Vodafone, started another one, IPO'd that, life was simple. But that was the biggest hard learning lesson. How do you sell things? Then I had the opportunity to become the CEO of a company called Lycos. Anyone remember it? What was it? A search engine. It was the second largest search engine in the world, owned by Telefonica and Bertelsmann. There is, was only one little challenge here. When I started, another little company started in Palo Alto, Google. So if you're now part of an executive board of Bertelsmann and Telefonica, what does the executive board do when a small shitty company in Palo Alto starts? Ignore it, of course. And when we can't ignore it anymore, what do they do? They ignore it again, correct. Then we come into the make fun of it. How will they ever survive? They don't even have a business model. But the challenge is this company was really killing us. So I went to my German boss and I said, Felix, you know, we really need to think outside the box here because they're really killing us. And then um, he looked at me and said, Jonas, there is a reason we have the box. That is because you should be inside the box and not outside the box. 
So I just went back to my frequency game and I pushed all my throttles in sales. How do you think it went? It was an epic failure. Epic. Google talked about always delighting the user. This was something totally new for me because my life had always been always delight the shareholders, myself or someone else. Users was just something we pushed through the door to pay ourselves great bonuses and sell the company. Google also talked about content is king, but then I said, no, sales is King Kong, and I just pushed the throttles. But it, as I said, was an epic failure. So this alone, running customer acquisition, is not enough. You always need to have something called delight. Because what did Google do? What did they do? They actually just did a better product. And if you're a sales guy, that's not fair. So when I say the word delight, what comes to mind? Well, what we have done is we've taken delight from the hierarchy of customer needs. In the top, you have delight. At the bottom, you have functionality. I can give you an example. Alfa Romeo tried to have a great delight during a period of time with design. The problem is, if the car doesn't go from A to B, much of the delight falls. Any Alfa Romeo owners here? Oh, they're becoming less and less, unfortunately. But Francesco, you basically said, Jonas, they don't understand, you know, it's a beautiful car. And then everyone said, but yeah, but it doesn't work, Francesco. Yeah, but I get a personal relationship with my mechanic, you know. I'm going to his daughter's wedding. But be aware of that, if that's the only perspective of delight. The challenge here is, what we often forget is, how do you innovate in delight? How do you think about the new products? Because when you often innovate in, safe, in a lot of features, over time, they just become functionality. So the challenge here for many of the big corporations is how do you innovate in tomorrow's delight? Because what used to be delight, one day will just be normal functionality. When I went meet startup young entrepreneurs, they're all full of trying to understand and innovate in tomorrow's delight. When I meet the big leaders of the world, the CEOs, they're panicking. They're, their company is all about efficiency and functionality. They have all the money, all the people, yet it's so difficult for them to try to innovate beyond. Let, get, let me give you an example of a company that had a very hard time during figuring out their delight. The company was Harley Davidson. During a period of time, they were getting fierce competition by Japanese motorcycles. It went so far that the company went into reconstruction. The management team had to leave and really try to understand how do we fix it. They needed to nail what are we selling, what is our delight, and what they came up with 20 years ago, still stands, or nearly 30 years ago, because they started, okay, let's really try, to, what, what are the strengths? Okay, we have no strength, the motorcycle is loud, it breaks down, blah, 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 blah. Okay, who, who, which customer group loves us? Hell's Angels. That's not the very brilliant, they're not very known for paying their bills, huh? But what they came up with at that point of time is that what we sell is the ability for a 43-year-old accountant to dress in black leather, ride through small towns, and have people be afraid of him. That is our delight. And this is our innovation intent. Because if what it all comes down to is basically understanding what is your friction-free storytelling. I often ask people, what are you selling? It's a very simple question, but it's very, very hard to answer. Ask yourself, what are you selling? What are you delivering? What is your delight? I had the, for, I had the opportunity to have Stefan Passion, the founder of H&M, in my board. And he talked about how important it had been for him to really unlock the friction-free storytelling. And people know that 
it has been a very successful journey for him. And what they defined as their delight is that going from a low cost company, they defined that we are a fashion company, but we're gonna have a zero less on the price tag. If Prada sells jeans for $300, we're gonna sell jeans for 30. If Yves Saint Laurent can be on Fifth Avenue, so can we. And if Gucci can have supermodels, so can we. And they took a journey that has been fantastic. Then comes another mod, then comes another company. So everything they talked about was fashion. Then comes another company called Sara. Do you have it here in Turkey? Yeah. To some extent, yes. They don't even call themselves a fashion company. They call themselves a logistic company. They sold what they believe is the most important and they put it in stores everywhere. They don't even have a collection. Then I started a company and invested in the company Salando, which is a tech fashion company, many say, but they see themselves as a tech company. I often complained in the board, I thought that the front page was really ugly. And um, then the head of fashion, she just looked at me and said, Jonas, don't underestimate the bad taste of Germans. <laughs> she was from BCG and everything she did was just a big Excel sheet. So we talked about frequency, how important it is to unlock it. We talked about building the world's best product. But over time, you also need a business model. I've tried that a lot of times. If you, maybe you'll figure it out later, maybe you won't, but you need to unlock it. And as you know, I had the opportunity of being part of this company. The challenge is what is the delight with a normal company or a normal phone call? I've just been part of this epic failure at Lycos. So we said, if we're gonna be true to ourselves, the pricing should be zero. That is the utterly delight. That puts a lot of constraints into the business model. So we started the innovation in zero games. We needed to think totally different to be able to re-unlock the thinking here. If this is Skype, if this is a telco, this is Skype. A telco loves to invest in infrastructure. At Skype, we said, let's use the existing internet that the customer is paying for. We found our first zero. Second, a telco loves to invest in switches. So we said, what happens if we let the computer that you own code the calls and transmit them? Because the CPU power was basically the same. We found another zero. Then to be really successful, you need to rack a lot of servers and send this traffic everywhere. How many here, by the way, use Skype? That's great fun. In the early days, can you remember when you used Skype and not using and coming back and your computer was super hot and the fan was going at max? Because if that was the case, your computer had become a super node and all traffic was routed through your computer because we came to the conclusion there's a lot of commu computers connected to the internet and not being used. Governmental buildings, you know, hospitals, wherever it was, big corporations, and by doing so, we found another zero. Then we had customer service. Customer service cost was quite this big cost for a lot of these companies. The challenge was that often when I called, you know, a telco's customer service, I was more pissed after I talked to customer service than before. <laughs> so we came to the conclusion, let's make it impossible to call Skype. Let's not have any phone numbers on our business cards. Let's not have any phone numbers anywhere. So if you don't like it, leave. And we found another zero. And what Tom has come to the conclusion is that if you look at many of the most successful startups or in big companies in the world, they have all innovated in zeros to get the cost advantage. Give me an example of a company that has also innovated in zeros. Google. 
Uber is a good example. You know, they, are, it's, um, they at least you know, don't own any cars, which is a very interesting perspective, and have redone the whole taxi company. Airbnb is the same. I personally like the company Google. Have you thought about that? They download all the information they can find on every server in the world, and then they sell advertisement. They don't even have a cost for their content. You can take companies like IKEA, flat packages, you have to assemble it themselves. All is about trying to understand how you can get these things together. So if I want to give you one ad three advices as an entrepreneur or leader today, unlock growth. How do you do it? How do you add frequency in a way that the consumer loves? Build the best product in the world. To innovate in zeros, innovate on the cost side you have. And then you can say, okay, Jonas, this is like, like, like quite difficult. You know, does it really work? Uh, it's not that difficult. You know, it's basically three questions you have to ask yourselves. What do you sell? To who? And why? Even my 10 year old can do this. I ask him, Philip, what are you selling? I'm selling cookies. Okay. To, to who? The people entering the community train. Okay, why? Give me some passion here. We have to because we're going on a class journey. And then his father can go, okay, but Philip, how have you innovated in zeros in this business model? And then he thinks for a while and then comes to the conclusion, if my mother buys the cookies, I make much more. So very simple. Thank you, that was all for me.